Good afternoon, uh, everybody. John Quelch here, the Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Herbert Half Hour today with Anthony Philipson, uh, who is uh, the British Consul General in New York and uh, the Trade Commissioner uh, for the United Kingdom in the US. Uh, I'm probably next to the ambassador of uh, the UK to the US, the most important British official uh, operating in our country. Uh, so welcome, uh, Anthony. It's a great pleasure to have you here today. I want to start with the uh, special relationship. Um, where did that term special relationship come from? And is the special relationship today really still that special? Well, thanks very much indeed, John. It's great to see you again. And uh, thanks for the chance to join the Herbert Half Hour. Um, so I think the, the phrase was coined by Winston Churchill um, 70 years ago, actually, when they were formulating what's called the Atlantic Charter, signed by the UK and US on board uh, the then HMS Prince of Wales in 1941, at a particularly difficult time for the UK uh, you know, in the context of the Second World War and with the US um, you know, considering its options. And I think you know, it was in our interest to reinforce the sense of a special relationship between the UK and the US, which, of course, rooted in history and uh, shared diaspora and the movement of people backwards and forwards. Um, I think it is still uh, a special relationship for a number of reasons. I think there are some enduring qualities to it, and I'm sure we'll talk more about these in a second, especially the business relationship, the flow, flow of trade and investment, the creation of jobs in both countries, uh, buy investment from both countries, et cetera, et cetera. But I think if you look at uh, you know, sitting here in New York, I look at the arts and cultural relationship, I think that's pretty extraordinary. Uh, not just between London and New York, but between the UK and the US. I think uh, the continued sense of, uh, you know, cousinhood, put it that way, you know, we, we feel related, we feel familiar. Although I think one thing I'm always struck by in the US is that uh, this is not the same as the UK, and uh, I think it's important for us to understand the differences. And then finally, I think there are some contemporary qualities to it. We published a document recently uh, called the Integrated Review that looks at uh, diplomatic, development, military, and economic uh, interests in the world. Uh, and in all of the challenges that we identify that we face there, and it's a particularly complicated world just at the minute, uh, there is no doubt the US is our number one ally, uh, both on the economic side, but also on the military side, the security side. The challenges we face, I think we will face together, shoulder to shoulder. We have troops in almost every theater in the world together. Uh, our security and intelligence relationship, I think, is unrivaled. And if you put all that together, uh, on top of that platform of the enduring qualities, I think that's still pretty special. So could, could you, uh, thank you, Anthony, could you talk a little bit more about the magnitude and trends in the trade and investment flows in particular? Yes, I mean, the, the, I'll, I'll start with some figures, if I may. I mean, they're a little bit dry, but I think they're important to recognize. So the, the US is our single most important trading partner. The, uh, total value of our trade between us last year was $266 billion. Um, the US takes 20% of our exports each year, our number one export market. Uh, the UK imports, 13% uh, of our imports come from the US. It's our most important single import uh, source. Uh, and then there's the investment relationship. Uh, the stock of investment in each other's country is almost the same, actually. It's about $480 billion in each country, from each country, uh, about 25% of each of our stock. Uh, overseas. And the jobs that that underpins in both countries, you know, we use this phrase that each day 1.7 million Brits go to work for an American company in the UK and 1.3 million Americans go to work for British companies invested in the US. And then specifically in Florida, for example, we are the number one uh, investor in the state. Our assessment is that 68,000 jobs in Florida rest on investment from the UK. So I think, you know, this is a significant relationship. Um, but it's also forward facing, you know, yes, it's the traditional manufacturing goods going each direction, but it's also about life sciences, financial services, the digital economy. Uh, and most importantly, I think it's, uh, it's hugely important to small and medium sized enterprises on each side of the Atlantic. Uh, and I feel they are the lifeblood of our communities, the heart of our economy. Uh, MNCs all started as SMEs. Um, and so, you know, I think it's it's a forward facing, hugely important relationship. Uh, and that's why the figures are a bit dry, but these are lived experiences for people in both countries. So I think that um, a number a number of us might ask whether or not Brexit 
has had any significant impact on the trade and investment flows. And especially for an American company that is looking to launch into Europe, would the United Kingdom still be the most desirable and obvious launching pad? So I think you know, for a long time, certainly most of the time that I've been a, a diplomat and certainly working on the economic side, we've had a pretty uh, comprehensive set of talking points that all started with the UK being the gateway to Europe for international investors. And on the back of that, we have built this reputation over the last, I would say, 20 years as being the major source of FDI in Europe. Uh, not only from the uh, from the US, but from elsewhere as well. Um, Brexit changes the context in which I think we talk about that, uh, but it doesn't take it away completely. Uh, the agreement that we reached with the EU at the back end of last year, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the further agreements on data, financial services that we're, we're negotiating now, uh, will all still mean that the UK will be highly engaged and highly uh, economically connected to the continent. So I would argue that uh, it is still a powerful uh, a powerful offer that we put out there. And above all, I think for US and as I say, other com uh, companies uh, looking to, to invest in the UK, you know, our mix of uh, investment in R&D, our investment in skills, our education system, uh, our openness, uh, you know, COVID aside, we'll come back to this in a second, we are one of the world's great international hubs uh, in terms of the movement of people. Um, and we are looking to be more open and more engaged with the world uh, as a result of being outside the EU. Our ministers talk about global Britain uh, a lot, and uh, you know, that is about being engaged with the global economy. And I think if you look at the other, then the policies and the regulatory piece we put in place in terms of competitive tax regimes, competitive incentives for, uh, for investment in the UK, uh, the Prime Minister's agenda around levelling up and creating opportunities for investment in all parts of the United Kingdom, I think, again, that, that's a pretty powerful offer for those considering where to put highly mobile international investment. Are there particularly, uh, um, are there particular locations uh, or areas in the UK where uh, US investors have found uh, a happy home other than obviously London? And uh, correspondingly, with respect to US investment in uh, uh, UK investment in the US, um, are there particular areas in the US which have been strong in terms of attracting UK engagement? So starting with the UK piece, I mean, I think, I think you can find US and important US investment uh, all over the United Kingdom, including in four, in all four nations. Um, you know, I was, when I visited Belfast a few years ago, you see the, the, the investment from Citibank there, the investment from the creative industries, HBO's investment in the Titanic quarter around Game of Thrones, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, if, certainly financial services investment, uh, huge investments in, in Edinburgh, sometimes like sort of you know, tweaks on my European colleagues when you ask where's the second most important financial services center in, the, in, the, in Europe uh, after London, it's not Frankfurt, it's not Paris, it's not Amsterdam, it's not Dublin, it's Edinburgh. So, you know, the, the, the creation of, um, or the revolution of tech around fintech and reg tech is attracting, I think, considerable amounts of investment uh, across the tech piece from all parts of the US into all parts of the United Kingdom. Life sciences, advanced manufacturing, you know, Boeing's investments, et cetera, they're, they're, they're all over the UK. And then here, I think one thing we've worked really hard on in the last few years, as well as uh, pushing forward on an agenda with the administration around negotiating a free trade agreement to take that economic relationship I mentioned into the future and make it even stronger and even deeper, uh, we're also looking to be much more engaged at state level. And that's in part because I think we have traditionally, I feel, too often thought about you know, the, the US as not as a static uh, economy, but you know, we're quite drawn to the traditional centers of activity. But if you look at some of the investments and the growth that are happening in places like Nashville or Austin or Jacksonville, uh, Portland, uh, you know, we need to be involved in these conversations uh, everywhere in the US. Individual states are, Florida, I believe, is comparable, maybe even slightly bigger than, 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 than the Netherlands. So you know, we need to think of states in the US as, as mini countries, and in some cases, quite big countries, uh, and make sure that we have the right engagement in order to realize those opportunities for UK investors and indeed UK exporters as well. Yes, I think uh, Florida is the uh, 17th largest economy in the world uh, mm. in its own right. Um, you mentioned uh, COVID earlier. Uh, what, what has been the impact of COVID on either 
uh, the special relationship broadly defined uh, and more specifically on the trade and investment flows. What have you noticed and do you expect there to be a rebound? Is there pent up demand in both respects that we're going to see uh, more of in the next uh, few months and uh, 2022? So, um, I mean, I think it's a complex question and it's, it, it merits a little bit of unpacking. Um, I mean, COVID first and foremost, of course, is a, is, a, is a human tragedy. And I think the impact on our communities in both the UK and US has been, has been severe and significant. Lots of people have, have lost members of family. Um, and I think, you know, and we're not out of it yet, although I think both countries have made incredible strides on the vaccination program. Uh, you know, this is still roiling our communities and indeed the global community, and we will not be out of this until we're all out of this together. Um, in terms of the economic impact, I mean, again, I think it's it's varied and will have impacts in the medium, short, medium and long term. Uh, in the short term, I think as we start to reopen and we're hoping that uh, you know, the UK is now opening up and starting to put countries on green amber lists that will allow for more travel. The US is still on an amber list at the minute. But I'm sure as soon as the data supports it, uh, we will be looking to, to change that uh, in, in good order. And hopefully sometime soon, we'll also see the US being able to lift its immigration, its travel restrictions on people coming in from the UK and the EU. And I think that will lead to quite an immediate uh, reopening of economic connectivity and economic activity. Um, I mean, I think, again, it's, it's, it's a sad reality. There will be some companies who will not be able to come back. They've, you know, the, the impact on them has just been too severe and too profound. But you know, we're seeing opportunity in, in other areas. Uh, and I think, again, that's what policymakers on both sides and businesses on both sides need to focus on. Where are we going to, uh, in the words of both the Prime Minister and the President, they both talk about building back better. Uh, and I think understanding the impact that the crisis has had on our supply chains, coming back with more resilient supply chains, more sustainable and greener supply chains, as both of us focus on uh, the big investments that are gonna need to be made in the green economy in order to meet our environmental targets and ambitions. Um, you know, that's, that's something we need to dial into and design into uh, the recovery, which I think will be, you know, we have dropped far, but this is not, I feel, I'm, I'm not an economist, I should stress, uh, but I feel this is not the same as the global financial crisis of 10, 12 years ago. Um, this was a sort of short, sharp shock and a closing of the economy and now it will reopen. Uh, but then there's the longer term costs and the scarring on the economy, uh, the impact and how we can sort of handle stimulus packages. And the, you, know, you can read the, the pieces day in, day out about people wondering what that's going to mean for future pressures within the economy and inflation risks, etc. I think at the minute we are both focused on reopening in an appropriately, uh, in an appropriate manner doing so as quickly as we can, getting economic activity back up and running, getting people back uh, into workplaces, uh, still with a very keen eye on the science and the data, uh, and then working together to understand the medium to long-term impacts. Um, do you think, uh, Anthony, that our uh, audience members will be able to take their summer holidays in London uh, or in the UK? And what, what progress has been made to uh, facilitate uh, vaccine passports or other mechanisms for easy entry into the UK? So I think there's uh, a considerable amount of work, as I say, going on. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to sound necessarily simplistic because the, 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 the detail and the complexity of it, of course, is all being handled by lots and lots of my colleagues in London, but also in, in close consultation with colleagues out here in the US, uh, both especially, of course, in the administration. Um, I think, you know, this it, it needs to be opened up in both directions, as I say. We will move countries onto the green list that will allow for... Uh, actually, the, the, those on the amber list, they can still get into the UK. It's just that they will need to isolate for that period um, uh, when they arrive uh, and go through the necessary testing. For those on a green list, they won't need to do that. Uh, and as I say, we will be reviewing... I think the government will review every three weeks which countries are on which lists, and I'm sure that we will move people onto the green list uh, when we can. Uh, obviously, as I say, we also need to see travel opening up um, this way uh, at the minute. Anyone who's been in the UK in the previous 14 days, unless they are a US citizen or they have specific visas and it's quite a constrained list, uh, simply can't get into the US. So we need to look at both of those uh, together. As I say, I, I, you know, we are very aware of the impact of the restrictions, not only on the travel industry itself, but on those who rely on the travel industry, whether that's business or leisure or personal travellers. 
number of people who had family here in the US, even jobs here in the US who happened to be in the UK when the restrictions came in in March last year, have still not been able to get back to this country. So, you know, we need to reopen, and I think we're both committed to doing that, uh, but in a sensible, proportionate, science-driven way. Uh, just one uh, aspect of uh, uh, trade and investment that I think uh, many on the call will be interested in is um, higher education. And um, there is a, a very strong international component to US uh, university undergraduate and postgraduate uh, populations, as there is in, in the US and indeed at uh, Miami Herbert Business School. Uh, the UK has been pretty, um, a, pretty accommodating um, with respect to uh, visa permits and uh, uh, work opportunities for graduating students. Could you just outline a little bit the UK government's philosophy on that and um, what uh, policies the UK has in place for foreign students studying there? So, um, I mean, the headline I think of this is that the UK wants to be seen as one of the great places in the world to study. We have some of the finest universities in the world as of course do, do, do we have here in the US. Um, and we want people to be able to come in and study at our universities. Uh, those people to people links that it develops are fundamentally important to the future of the special relationship, but also just the future of our overall relationship with the US in so many ways. It builds trust, it builds familiarity, it builds connections. And I think that is the, the bedrock of our future relationship. And the UK on the back of uh, leaving the EU has put in place uh, a new immigration framework that again allows for people to come in and study, allows for people to come in and work. We want to attract the best and the brightest uh, from all over the world, including uh, here in the US. Uh, I think some of the precise uh, aspects of that are still being put in place and I'm very happy to uh, have the team here follow up with anyone at uh, the university uh, if that's helpful, including through our consulate down in uh, Miami. Um, because I think, you know, we will, but I think we, the, the headline is we're open. We want people to come in. Uh, we also want UK students to be able to come here. Um, the final thought I would say or offer is, you know, a big part of our, our work, certainly here in New York and in the consulate in Miami and around the US is our scholarship program, the Marshall scholarships, the Fulbright scholarships, uh, and even now still the Rhodes scholarships. And again, they are a way of reaching into uh, the broad communities of the US and making sure that the UK is seen as a compelling location and an accessible location uh, for people to be, going, to be able to go and study at our universities. So, um, as you know, uh, Miami has been uh, touted fairly heavily uh, in the last few months as a uh, future uh, tech hub. There's been talk of uh, uh, Silicon Beach as opposed to Silicon Valley. Um, as an experienced uh, student of foreign investment and trade, uh, do you think that there is real potential here or do you think there's uh, a little bit more sizzle than steak uh, in the proposition? No, I think I'm there's... Um... I'm really test testing your diplomatic skills here. <laughs> no, I think there is steak as well as sizzle. Um, I mean, I, going back to my earlier point, really, I mean, I think it's 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 so important to to understand where the opportunities are and and I think maybe to think about that in two ways. First of all, you know what is it that authorities in Miami uh, or indeed Florida more generally will want to be able to put in place that creates that right mix, that ecosystem that will attract uh, the future of the the tech industry. Uh, and of course, we've gone through some of this ourselves in in the UK, where people have talked about Silicon Fen and the uh, the research areas around uh, Cambridge. Uh, or the research issue areas around Oxford, the Golden Triangle, uh, in London, Edinburgh, as I mentioned, all over the UK. And, and I think it's a mix of creating uh, an attractive place for people to want to work, but also a place from which people connect, can connect uh, with the rest of the global tech economy. Um, I see no reason why that shouldn't be possible uh, in Florida, given the lifestyle it offers, given its connectivity with uh, Europe, uh, but also with uh, Latin and South America. Um, so I can see considerable opportunities um, there. The, the only thing I would say, and I always feel this about the UK, and maybe it's a slightly simplistic point to make, you know, we, we're not going to look to attract everything. Um, and the, 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 the volume of growth and the pace of growth uh, within the broader tech community, I think is incredibly exciting for both the UK and US. And as well as making sure that we are creating the right ecosystems in our own countries, 
I think it's really important that we are having the right discussion between the two countries about how we set the rules and regulations and the norms of the tech game in the future of the global economy. So we've done huge amounts, I would say, in the UK uh, around AI and data ethics. Um, again, docking into what's happening here uh, in the US, I would say possibly slightly controversially, possibly one of the most exciting areas of development in North America in AI is actually around Toronto. Um, so again, it's, you know, we think about North America and then specific areas where there are opportunities, but I certainly think Florida has huge amounts to offer. But as I say, really important that the UK and US are having that conversation together and then taking that into organizations, whether it's the G7, which we will chair this year and look forward to welcoming President Biden to Cornwall uh, next month, uh, or whether it's the OECD, the WTO, uh, et cetera. There's painting those, those future rules and norms in a way that is uh, in line with the interests of the UK and US economy, I think is hugely important. How important and in what way um, are universities uh, critical to um, the execution of this promise? I think they're absolutely vital. Um, you know, they are the generators of uh, talent, the generators of our, uh, the, the research piece of it, and they are, they are, I think, the, the fulcrum for the, the move between research to development. And then, you know, you find clusters developing around uh, the great universities in the UK and US uh, that really then takes that to the next level. Um, I remember a few years ago talking um, to uh, one of the, the leaders of one of our great life sciences companies. We were talking about, you know, how, how do you avoid this sense of sort of competition amongst the cities? Uh, in, and this was specifically in the context of the UK. It was while I was in Singapore and we were talking about how Singapore has done it. And I felt then, I feel now that actually if we, if we use the universities almost as a way of sort of identifying the centers of excellence in particular areas, you know, not everyone is going to be the world's leading center for AI or for graphene. Uh, but if we see what's happening around those universities and then build around that with sympathetic local and national uh, planning and regulation and policy making, uh, then I think that's, to my mind at least, that's, that's one way into it. Uh, and it becomes sort of you know, bottom-up organic growth and opportunity rather than sort of top-down. I continue, I would say this is a civil servant, of course, I continue to think there is a role for government uh, to get the right policy and regulatory frameworks right. Uh, I think, again, going back to fintech, if you look at what we've done on the regulatory sandbox with the regulators, the policymakers and the industry coming together to understand how to get the balance right between regulation and innovation in fintech, um, that's hugely important, but you know, we, we still need that sense of where's the R&D, where's the talent going to come from, and I think the university is hugely important in that. So you, you uh, uh, studied history as your undergraduate uh, degree. Uh, we hear a lot about STEM, STEM, STEM uh, in terms of uh, university uh, priority setting, um, but not so much about the humanities. Um, what, what, what do you say to someone who says, uh, well, you know, what does a history degree tell you that's important to uh, being a trade and investment uh, specialist at the international level? Um, so uh, I, I'll try and keep this short and not make it a sort of personal retrospective. But um, I mean, I, I studied history. Uh, actually, well, if I go back half a step, my A-levels, as we call them in the UK, uh, were actually maths, physics and history. Um, so there was a bit of STEM in there as well as a bit of arts. Um, I ended up doing history at university because I wanted, uh, I'd been born and lived overseas as a child. Uh, I've always been interested in the UK's uh, sort of international uh, story uh, and I wanted to work overseas. And I thought that uh, actually the best way to do that uh, for someone who was also sort of starting to be interested in public policy uh, was to join the Foreign Office. Um, so I went off and did history and applied to join the Foreign Office who <laughs> at the time said, no, thank you. Uh, so I ended up taking my first job with the then Department for Trade and Industry, and I think that's where I then got my first sort of taste of uh, economic policy making, but still very much in an international uh, context. Um, since then, I've been lucky enough to do postings on the trade policy side in Washington, uh, to be High Commissioner in Singapore, and now doing this job here, all of which I've loved. And in between those, I've headed up the Iran Department in London and worked for the Prime Minister on the Foreign Affairs side. Uh, back in 2004, 2007. So I've, I've done a bit of everything. And I think I always say whenever I do talks like this or talks with students that I've always really enjoyed doing, um, what I think a, a degree in the arts gives you or the humanities or certainly history is a sense of curiosity. 
uh, understanding the world that we lived in then, the, the dynamics that shaped it, but also I think that gives you a context uh, in which to think about the world that we live in now. It doesn't give us the answers, but it gives us the context in which to think about it. And then again, slightly controversially, you know, I always say to people that there's no great mystique really to diplomacy. Diplomacy is the art of talking to people. Um, it's the art of, again, making those connections, building those partnerships, making them load bearing for the future and understanding in the context, really going back to the integrated review in the context of the challenges we face, what is it we need to do with who and how uh, to ensure our future prosperity and our future security. So within that, we need people doing humanities, we need people doing STEM, uh, we need the right mix and the balance within our uh, economies and our communities. Uh, and above all, we need to create economies that open ourselves up to attract the right mix of people in. And I think that's what we in the UK do. I think it's what the US have done extremely successfully and we will keep doing going forward. Terrific, terrific. So let, let, let me ask you uh, um, uh, another slightly historical question, if I may. Um, wh why do you think um, the United Kingdom has a monarchy that has lasted so long and with such a resilience relative to other countries that have or have had monarchies? It's an excellent question. I think I will, I will answer it as a citizen um, as much as anything else, although I'm extremely proud of having uh, HM uh, in both of my titles as both Her Majesty's Consul General and Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner. Um, I think you know, every country has its own story. Um, and uh, some of those stories are longer lasting than others. Uh, some of those stories have had common roots, including here in the UK and the US, and have then gone in different directions uh, over the last 250 years. Um, and you know, some countries have had monarchies and then decided to try something else. We tried that in the 1640s uh, and 50s, um, and then they have returned to monarchies. Others have never had monarchies. They've gone for elected presidencies. Um, I think the monarchy in the UK is a hugely important part of our heritage and our history, but I think they have also been, uh, including current uh, Her Majesty now, uh, who next year will celebrate 70 years uh, on the throne, which is quite remarkable. Uh, you know, they are representatives of the UK in every sense of the word, in all parts of the world. Uh, the impact when they travel to countries, I've seen it myself uh, uh, in, in Singapore, I've also I had the pleasure and the privilege of being part of the first state visit by the Singapore president back to the UK uh, in 2013. You know, they are part of the way that we can engage countries at the highest level, uh, at the same time as being very human uh, parts of our story uh, and a very human part of our engagement at all levels around the world. Um, and I think that's what gives uh, our royal family, if I can, again, put it very personally and as a citizen, that's what gives them their resilience. They are a contemporary part of our story, but rooted in our heritage and history in a very, uh, I think, meaningful way. And they are impactful when it comes to trade and investment. I think so. I mean, it goes back to my point really about diplomacy. It's about making connections and it's about making people feel that they want to be part of the story with us. And I think that's, that's part of it. All right. Uh, Anthony, uh, I want to thank you so much for uh, joining us. Uh, it looks like we're already out of time. We could have gone on for easily another 30 minutes, but uh, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. And uh, we look forward to being able to travel back and forth across the Atlantic uh, freely and uh, uh, with pleasure as soon as possible. Thank you very Wish much. Wish you all the best. Thank you, and, Anthony. Uh, Thank, thanks to all of our audience members for joining us and uh, best wishes from all of us at Miami Herbert Business School. Thank you.